Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The session this morning will be on gun trafficking, but there will also be some <coughs> trafficking information. As most of you know, one kind of goes hand in hand with the other. Your panelists this morning will be the Assistant Commissioner of Police from Barbados, Laura Williams. The other panelists will be Captain John Salazar from the United States. And the third panelist will be for Bermuda, and his name is Alex McDonald. Ladies and gentlemen, your panel for this morning. Good morning. Can I, first of all, ask a question? Uh, could I ask members of law enforcement to raise their hands? We look around and see who these people are within law enforcement. Thank you. Now could I ask members of Crime Stoppers Boards, our civilian group, to raise their hands? Thank you. Good. Just keep going. I come from a very small community, an island called Bermuda, where guns are illegal. Yet over the last five years, 12 murders have taken place within the, what we call the organized crime, the gang community. They've all been taking place because two, two rival groups are trying to get turf to sell their drugs. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> to anyone in this audience here, no matter whether you're in a large city or in a small town, our organized crime has changed over the last number of years. Life does not seem to be something that people cherish anymore. Because if there is a reason for someone to be disposed of, they are. And by doing that, in many ways, it's through a firearm. Now, in the United States, there's always been a big debate on the right for firearms. Everybody has their opinion. In my area and in the Caribbean, Firearms are illegal, yet still murders do occur by firearms. In my community, and we say we are a very, we call ourselves the jewel of the crown of the Caribbean islands, even though we're not in the Caribbean islands. Guns are extremely illegal in the sense that if you're caught with a gun, it's a minimum sentence of five years. But the problem being that the movement of people in and out of our country, whether it's on cruise ships and yachts, allow guns to come into the community. And this morning, what we want to talk about is how that affects us as Crime Stoppers individuals, whether we're law enforcement or the civilian board members. I'll give you a prime example how a small community like mine can be affected by guns. And I'd like each of you to think about your community and what has happened in each of every one of your communities over the last few years involving guns. Organized crime, or another word for gang activity or cartels, have moved into the, the neighborhoods to threaten good living people to do what they wish them to do. Intimidation, um, extortion in the stores. We're fortunate in my community, we don't have that yet. But what we do have is a group of two rival gangs who are out to um, disturb and destroy our culture. And when it does, it affects everyone. It affects the business person, it affects the community that they're in, and it affects our international movement of whether it's tourism or finance. In my community, for example, guns, as I keep telling, are illegal. But through, I have just retired from the police service after 32 years. And one of the things through our intelligence department we have managed to understand is, now, for some of you, this may sound really strange, but we know that five murders in the last three years have been caused by the same gun, by different rivalries. So we have what we call a rent-a-gun. Now, our intelligence tell us in Bermuda that that rent-a-gun goes for an evening, just like you would go to Hertz or Avis and rent a car,
But that renter gun goes for an evening for just under $1,000 to rent a gun, ladies and gentlemen. See how fortunate you are to live in a community where guns are coming and going? <laughs> so when we're talking about guns, we have to start talking about how we traffic firearms within our community. Every one of us here are here for a reason today. The law enforcement, they know the value of what information comes through our communications, whether it's through telephones or whether it's through the internet, through our web uh, or our, our email accounts, through our tips and such like. And what has been happening is that have we not seen an increase in firearm violence? No. Can someone put their hand up in this audience to say they haven't noticed an increase in firearm violence in their community? And if you look around, ladies and gentlemen, there's not one hand. Because it's moving. How it affects Crime Stoppers. A number of years ago, I went to, with the support of the Crime Stoppers partners, uh, US Marshals, I went down to a city in Mexico called Juarez. And when I was down there, I met with a group of individuals, business people, who could not be identified even to their police department, but they wanted to start a Crime Stoppers program. They managed to get a connection through the right sources. It was a club, the Rotary Club. And these group came to Crime Stoppers International and they said, we want to get something done because the amount of guns that's coming through their community that's threatening their businesses and family lifestyles has gone through the roof. Well, we established a Crime Stoppers program with the support of our international partners, and it ran for a short while, for just over a year, and it was successful. But one of the problems they had is that the people that tried to run it could not be identified as a Crime Stoppers board member, why? We all know why, don't we? Their life would have been at stake. So when we're talking about Crime Stoppers, we're also talking about what opportunities a local community can do to help get the crime, the serious crime, off the streets. You are an important part of how these next two presenters are going to go forward in their way of dealing with information coming through our network. Law enforcement now need us. They need us to start doing projects in our community that will identify where these firearms are coming. And our boards of directors need to know where these firearms are coming from. In all of our regions, firearms are causing what we would call serious crime to explode into mass murder in some areas. Going back to my little island, my little paradise, those of you who were fortunate to come to our conference a few years back, up until um, five or six years ago, if we got one crime a year, a murder a year, we were, we were you know, and it's usually domestic, we were thinking we were bad. Now, every few months, there's a shooting, a murder caused by a firearm that is illegally brought into our island. So it is something that we have to address as an organization that combines, and it's the only organization that combines intelligence that can help law enforcement. Now, I'll come back towards the end to wrap up. I'd like now to present to you uh, Assistant Commissioner from Barbados, who's gonna give you an oversight to how he sees it in the region that he works in. Thank you, sir. Uh, <clears throat> good morning. First, let me thank the Board of Directors of Crime Stoppers Barbados Inc. for inviting the Royal Barbados Police Force to participate in this the 33rd Conference of Crime Stoppers. Um, I believe it's the first time that we have been so invited. And I bring you greetings from the Commissioner of Police Barbados and the other people of Barbados. The issue of firearms trafficking
constantly engages the attention of law enforcement agencies in the Caribbean region and has been for some time mostly a collection <laughs> right uh, mostly a collection of island states responsibility for dealing with firearms has been entrusted to the commissioners of police, the customs and coast guard agencies, and to a lesser extent, immigration. They also have some measure of responsibility because of their duties at the border. Let me state at the outset that Barbados and most of these island nations, they do not have a firearm industry. So any firearms that enter those countries cross the borders. Um, they are imported legally or illegally from firearm producing countries like the US, South America, <coughs> Europe, and others around the globe. I want to state at the outset too that in Barbados there does not, and in the Caribbean generally, there does not exist a right to have and bear arms. This state of affairs has served us in good stead. We do not have groups or militias in circumstances where citizens with relative ease acquire firearms. Yet, you heard it from Alex, with increasing frequency, small arms and ammunition, along with the few larger ones, the assault weapons, the AK-47 and the M-16, they continue to make their way across our porous borders and into the hands of criminals. These are the illegal weapons which are used in the commission of crime, ranging from threats and assaults through bodily harm to homicides. In a statement attributed to the OAS Secretary General, Latin America and the Caribbean is the region with the highest number of murders involving firearms in the world. Similarly, in a statement attributed to the Honorable Peter Bunton, Minister of National Security in Jamaica, the number of murders committed by use of guns in the first six months of 2012, 2011, 2010, and 2009 were 67.6%, 70.2%, 78%, and 76%, respectively. The figures are indicative of the impact of their presence and use, and the need to take action to stem the flow of arms in the region. All of the countries in the region have been affected. <coughs> the difference is a matter of degree. The injury occasioned by the use of legitimately acquired weapons or those under license is negligible. There is evidence of possession by otherwise law-abiding citizens in response to a need to protect themselves from the criminal element. This weapon in the hands of the criminal places him at a considerable advantage. And if you remember the presentation by the featured speaker on Tuesday, you will remember him speaking of staring down the barrel of, I think it was a nine millimeter. Much pain and suffering is inflicted on the victims and the relatives. The cost of hospital treatment is phenomenal. Man hours are lost by employers. In jurisdictions where gun violence is rampant, villagers have been afraid to venture out after certain hours and remain prisoners in their own homes. States of emergencies have been enforced, preventing our abiding citizens from going about their usual business. The presence of gun violence results in the flight of persons from the communities, and with them, the flight of or diversion of capital, both foreign and local. This state of affairs has implications for the economies, especially in those countries depending heavily on tourism as a source of income generation and economic prosperity. Firearms tra trafficking and violence has the capacity to destabilize legitimate regimes 
and often results in the death of innocent civilians. We in Barbados have our share of it. But at the level of CARICOM, the impact has been recognized and so with the assistance of the international community, these countries have met to trash out ways and means of dealing with the flow of illegal arms and the concomitant fear and violence, loss of life. So what are the factors that facilitate the entry of illegal firearms into the islands and the region? With the spread of drug trafficking and associated violence, the need to protect turf, the need to protect self, the need to protect delivery of shipments, and the formation of gangs resulted in a demand for illegally held firearms. As it relates to firearms trafficking, there is no evidence to suggest the large-scale diversion of legal cargoes or the falsification of commercial shipping documents, thereby facilitating the entry of illegal weapons into the region. However, the traffickers have been able to penetrate our borders concealing weapons in the bills of ships and in containers. There's a brisk barrel trade between the U.S. and the islands, and there have been instances of shipments being concealed in barrels with foodstuffs, clothing, and other articles, along with concealment in motor vehicles, television sets, and other goods. Fishing boats and yachts present <coughs> opportunities for the illegal entry of these weapons into the region. The movement of yachts within territorial waters and the ability of fishing boats to land their cargoes anywhere along coastlines present special challenges. The vigilance of border officials at the official ports of entry has forced gun runners and drug dealers to land their cargoes along the poorest coastlines and it has been known to that there were drops of contraband from the air from small aircraft. Lack of adequate resources, equipment, including human resources, have also presented challenges to these island nations and have facilitated these articles crossing our borders. As a region, the lack of sufficient patrol boats for the coastline adequate surveillance and technology, the absence of sufficient amount of rotary ring aircraft, and insufficient manpower to patrol the coastlines makes it easy for traffickers to enter, deposit their cargoes, and make good their escape. A tight rein must also be held on firearm dealers and gun clubs in the region. They are trusted agents, and because of the price, these articles, and I'm referring to guns and ammunition, fetch on the black market, some unscrupulous dealers or clubs facilitate the sale and or distribution of arms and ammunition to persons not authorized to be in possession of these articles. Stringent controls need to be placed on these operators of shooting clubs to ensure that those bent on a Korean crime have little access to firearms training and access to weapons and ammunition. To give an example, in Barbados, a police swoop on a legitimate dealer revealed his being in possession of weapons non-manufactured or assembled on the island, and items which the dealer would not have been ordinarily given permission to import or possess and I'm speaking of an article like a rocket launcher or an AK-47. The suit also led to the abandonment and the finding of a cache of both illegally and legally imported firearms. In examining the availability of firearms and violence to the community, it is necessary to examine those owned and used by state agents. I refer to accusations level against law enforcement for making state weapons available to the criminal element, whether by way of loan or rental, 
or by theft and subsequent sale. We also need to focus on the use of excessive force by our officers. And I can speak that in the case of Barbados, just after the American invasion of Grenada, quite a few of these assault weapons made their way into the island by those soldiers who had served in Grenada. The traffickers also cannot successfully enter jurisdictions, deliver their cargo, and leave undetected unless there is some support or collusion from persons working at our borders, whether they work in law enforcement or in a civil capacity. These workers are easily corrupted and rewarded handsomely for looking the other way. The traffickers, because of the sums at their disposal, are in a position to buy protection from law enforcement, obtain political support, leading to the undermining of law enforcement efforts. Within the Caribbean context, one cannot speak to firearms trafficking without mentioning drug trafficking. Firearms are usually recovered with seizures, perhaps being used by traffickers for their personal protection. And Barbados, the most easterly of the island chain, has an international airport which serves as a hub for travelers to the US, to Canada, and Europe. It has a relatively busy seaport which handles a sizable amount of cargo containers coming from all over the world. Barbados produces, but is not a large scale producer of illegal drugs. Common drugs entering the island are marijuana from Jamaica and St. Vincent, and cocaine mainly from South America. Traffickers therefore seek to get their cargoes to this destination for transport to the US, to Europe, to Canada. Initially, the air and sea ports were used as gateway for these illegal substances to enter, disguised as legitimate cargo. However, the vigilance of border security officials has made it more difficult difficult for these traffickers to ferry these illegal goods into Barbados. What has been our response? Firearms legitimately imported are used by law enforcement, and I refer to the military and the police. Authorized security agencies, sporting organizations, and some citizens who prove to the licensing authority was the commission of police that their lives and our property are at a higher risk of being affected by the criminal element in a most violent way. In a population of just over 275,000, those persons to whom licenses are issued total 4,500. And this is inclusive of the security guard agencies, the privately owned weapons, and those used by sporting organizations. But in Barbados and generally the English-speaking countries, there is in existence, administered by the commissioners, a relatively strict regime with regards to the import and export of firearms, the licensing and disposal for owners. Measures are also in place to improve accountability and auditing procedures of firearms stocks in the island held by the police, the military, dealers, and shooting clubs. In other jurisdictions, this um, authority is granted to uh, civilian authority. But in the case in Barbados to deal with the influx of firearms, what we have done is that we have established an anti-gun unit which investigate all firearm reports, all incidents of firearm being used, and we have, this has yielded some positive outcomes. At the border, there has been monitoring of traffic via an integrated coastal radar surveillance system, which allows us to see um, small boats coming into the, our territorial waters. 
There's a program too in place at our ports that provides for the scanning of cargo and containers. But you know that this has to be done selectively because to scan every container will result in a um, um, bottlenecking of the cargo is going to um, people involved in commerce. We have signed with the OAS a memo, memorandum of understanding and received the Dotping marking machine, which will allow us to trace firearms, to mark and trace firearms entering and leaving Barbados. We have also acquired, through the assistance of the Government of Canada, the IBIS um, equipment, which will allow us to track um, ballistic information on firearms use in the island and the Caribbean because Barbados will be part of the Ribbon project, which involves Trinidad, Jamaica, Belize, and eventually the other islands of the Eastern Caribbean. We will continue to make use of the National Tracing Center in the United States via E-Trace to assist us in tracing firearms and ammunition used in the Caribbean. The United Nations Regional Center for Peace and Disarmament and Development in Latin America is very active in the region, trading our law enforcement personnel in the region. And they are scheduled to be in Barbados later this year to do some training in relation to stockpile management. We all recognize that law enforcement is an expensive undertaking. And within a Caribbean context, no single institution or state can mount any successful challenge against firearms or drug trafficking on its own. Any response must be a co cooperative and a coordinated one involving all the agencies charged with that responsibility, in addition to gathering support and assistance of the public, including entities like Crime Stoppers. In the face of threats made to victims and witnesses and the commission of crimes in the presence of persons other than law enforcement personnel, Crime Stoppers has a critical role to play as a medium for citizens who wish to pass relevant information to the police without fear of being identified by the police themselves or the criminal element. This is a useful and important supplement to other initiatives aimed at firearms control. We would suggest, though, an opportunity for greater involvement via Crime Stoppers assistance with community outreach projects to mobilize citizens against the use of guns in their communities. Such schemes would use community leaders and prominent personalities in sports and entertainment. In closing, the trafficking in firearms has brought considerable harm to the communities in the region and beyond. The impact has been far reaching and its management requires an integrated and coherent approach, not only at the national level, but at the regional and international. The nations in the region must continue to share information and intelligence, resources, continue joint training and operational initiatives, and go forward as a united body to the international partners in their quest for assistance and the control of the flow of arms to the region. I now take this opportunity to commend Crime Stoppers International for their support to law enforcement in an effort to detect, solve, and prevent crime in the various communities. Um, you, their willingness to volunteer information through Crime Stoppers has resulted in the solving of a number of crimes. Your willingness has engendered the confidence of these people to come forward and report crimes to you, through you, for the benefit of the police organizations. 
We in law enforcement have long recognized that we are unable to do our work without the assistance of the public and civic-minded organizations like Crime Stoppers. Through your efforts, you have managed to place before law enforcement tips and information that otherwise would have been lost. We look forward to your continued support in the coming years. Thank you. Um, before our next speaker, I just want you to, to think of one common word that the Assistant Commissioner came out with right through his presentation. One common word. Cross borders. Because whether it is a state border, a national border, or an international border, every one of us in this room will be affected. Every one of us, whether we're in the small town, the large city, or the county, will be affected. Uh, just before our next presenter, John, comes up here, think about in your community what you have been doing or can do to move this next phase forward. And we'll come back to that once John has his presentation. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I do want to extend my gratitude to Crime Stoppers International and Crime Stoppers uh, USA for the invitation and the honor to speak before you today. Uh, I want uh, to speak about, or they asked us to speak about firearms, but when we when we look at at the situation of guns and drugs, we can't stop there. Um, why? Because of Technology, because of the globalization, affects um, these things have, how would I say, um, grown to, to new levels. And I know my colleagues that are present in law enforcement can uh, attest to that. You know, at one time, drug cartels, drug organizations uh, were primarily a uh, the ones that affected us most were out of uh, South America. But all that uh, changed over the course of the years, and now <clears throat> very potent organizations are based in uh, Mexico. I come from Laredo, Texas. Laredo, Texas is a border area that uh, is one of the major points of entry into the U.S. along the Texas border. We have four bridges and a railway bridge that also affects us. Uh, we have approximately, on every 10 month period, close to 3 million people that cross foot traffic and probably about 3.5 to 3.7 million in vehicle traffic. So, <clears throat> and those are the illegal, I mean, pardon, pardon me, the, the legal entries. You know, border patrol apprehensions, usually on a month, uh, or on a yearly basis, 10 month uh, is about 36,000. So those are, those are uh, large numbers that we're talking about. As I mentioned, um, I want to go into uh, some of the statistics to show you. I also want to talk about collateral crimes because it's no longer just guns. It's no longer just drugs. It's no longer the regional cartels that dominated an area of Mexico because they are now all national in Mexico and in case somebody did not know it, uh, the major Mexican cartels have presence in over 52 countries in the world. They purposely send out cells to set up operational bases. And I'm sure that a lot of you folks from the international community have seen changes, have have observed things going on in your community that involves uh, these type of situations. This is just, let me show you um, some statistics. These are statistics generated exclusively through the Crime Stoppers program in our area. These stats do not include seizures, 
that have come in from the multi-agencies that are in our area, from the FBI, from DEA, ICE, Border Patrol. These are simply stats from our Crime Stoppers phone lines. And so we're looking at quite a large number of drugs. Okay. The center area on the map where the thickest part of it is, that's where we're at. And through there is where you see how the routes extend throughout the United States and um, affects probably many of the states that are being represented here today. This will give you a little view of the cartels that are now in existence. Some people here on the television, on the radio, about certain cartels. But these are active and functioning cartels that affect us throughout the United States and actually throughout the world. Just a few photos of some of the bridges that we have so you get an idea of the traffic that comes across. In this photo, this was an intelligence photo. And so you could see the uh, how bold these people are. Do you notice that fellow in the middle that's got the t-shirt uh, with the cartel del Golfo? And they're all paddling across on a load of uh, drugs. When they observe the uh, agents, they had to go back across the river and take their merchandise back into their trucks. And that's just one of the folks, um, you know, these are just the, the apprehensions, the observations, because uh, it's a numbers game and, and um, you know, how many do we get, how many get by. It's hard to put a figure on it, but typical seizures, it's a belly dump truck. And that's what comes out of the belly. Again, uh, obviously the states, uh, law, the law enforcement, my law enforcement partners here, uh, I know that uh, every state has an active interdiction program and uh, they're very aggressive. They intercept drugs going north and uh, money going south, which is the same thing that we do. Uh, just uh, we just have a lot more because we're right at the point of entry and uh, that's a, a concern in, in, in many areas. Typical seizure um, of ton quantities and, and that's and when, when, I, when, I, when you see these photos don't think this is just going on in Laredo. This is going on at every major point of entry you know? and that's, this is, this is uh, the, the, the flood that, that we all have to deal with and ultimately winds up with the end user in your local neighborhoods. Now, when we move to firearms, these are seizures, or this is a seizure out of one case. Okay. Um, you guys know that, um, or my fellow Americans know that uh, it's not really difficult to obtain firearms. Uh, particularly in Texas, you can get them at gun shows. Uh, you can get them uh, off the classifieds in the newspaper. And there's just um, these organizations not only have exporters of drugs, but they have importers of weapons. We have uh, cells of these folks that uh, dedicate themselves to buying weapons. Some of them are coming out of the Midwestern states, flowing into our area and through our area into Mexico. And the other point is uh, through Central America. We've detected large, large numbers of weapons that have been
taken into the cartel dominated areas by uh, different types of traffickers of weapons and also um, sometimes there's there's issues with government officials that uh, that uh, help them and large seizures of weapons occur on those borders with Mexico and Guatemala uh, now these guys have expanded not only from your AK-47 uh, to their, your M-16. Now that well, there have been seizures of laws, rockets, for those of you who understand what those are. Uh, we have uh, seized uh, a couple of SAM missiles and uh, there has been a countless number of grenades that have been seized. So we're talking about major trafficking both ways. But I do want to get into something else here and that's, let's talk about collateral crimes that sometimes we don't consider. When we go into a review of where these groups are gaining millions and billions of dollars, we look at these collateral crimes. When I talk about extortion, in those areas you can't have a functioning business unless you pay the extortion fees. We also have wholesale kidnapping. What do I mean by that? Is that there are houses with 40, 50 kidnapped victims to include women and children that are held for ransom from family members. Is it spillover? Absolutely. Why? Because a lot of these people have family members in the U.S. who are extorted for that ransom. We look at street taxes. These cartels have dominated everything now. And so that's one of the things that we may not see on the surface, but they have a criminal importation tax. Not only when you go into those areas, not only do you have to pay customs, these guys have their own customs who you have to pay to be able to take your merchandise or to export your merchandise into their country because if you don't, you're not going to have that merchandise much very long. Human trafficking. Human trafficking issues, global issues. It's estimated seven billion annually in cost. Stolen vehicles, theft, freight, and one of the things that a lot of people never thought about is pirated merchandise. Do you know that uh, several of the cartels actually have logos on their pirated CDs and DVDs with their brand? Yeah, these guys are out there. Not only that, they are also producing pirated software. That's a, that's a tremendous loss there. And we're looking at, even when, when we look at uh, the losses there, 75 billion annually, we look at theft. Pemex is the government-owned um, gasoline company in Mexico. They siphon off, off their major pipelines. And where does that gasoline wind up? In the U.S., where it's sold in the U.S. So um, these guys are out there and they're making a bunch of money. And it's not just about guns and drugs anymore. This is an example. This, you look at this um, truck here, that has $2.5 million worth of shaver or shaving blades that came from the Gillette company. And these were in a warehouse being ready to be uh, exp or taken into Mexico. But we seized that off of Crime Stoppers tip. It's one of our pirated CDs with their logos on there. Now we go into what do we do to try to put a dent in this crime? Well, our major focus
The concern we have as crime stops, of course, is who do you report? But many of the uh, weapons are held by organised crime members, crime gang, and how do we therefore protect the community to ensure that they are safe in reporting such weapons? Because we know that the people who are going to potentially report such weapons are known to those organised gangs and criminals. <coughs> and uh, in terms of what's happening in Barbados, I'd be interested to know what measures you take in the way in which you promote the need for the community to come forward with that type of information. Do you have any thoughts on uh, the approaches? I didn't get your question. So the point there, of course, is uh, we've got to be very careful about the community coming forward with information on illicit firearms, particularly those firearms held by organised crime gangs, and the likelihood of reprisal and uh, other issues that may threaten the community members coming forward. So I would be interested to know whether you have thought about what measures you would put in place to protect the community. What type of um, advice would you give community members when coming forward with that type of information to protect themselves? Uh, to start off with the dead <laughs> stoppers, that makes provision for sending, if you, if you have information on any sort of crime, you send it through Crime Stoppers. The phones are answered in um, in Canada, not in Barbados. So that is a way of protecting um, persons in Barbados. If you are bold enough then to give the information in Barbados, there is a, a, a line, a line available to the police control which is not monitored in the sense that you can see where the call is coming from, but you can send um, confidential information to that line. But in terms of crime stoppers, they're doing a wonderful job in Barbados in that regard because the police does not know where they, the call is coming from. I guess the key there is to ensure that the anonymity of the anonymity of the caller is preserved. Yes. That's the only way. For yeah. So when we go out to the Crime Stoppers program to alert Australians, that they must call, use the anonymous tip line to do so? Yes, that, that is fair to the public. I, I would like to add that, um, yes, uh, anonymity is, is a top priority on that. Um, in our program, we, I have my officers monitor and end phone calls, and even if there's more information we need, we are prohibited calling that person back or making any contact whatsoever with that person. So, you know, the, 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 the primary thing is anonymity. And I think that that gives um, people, uh, it encourages them to call, knowing that there's no backlash because um, it, it can be serious. A question about uh, the war as crime stoppers. And any other, are there, are there more than that one program? And is that one program still in existence? And what is the status of crime stoppers in Mexico? Pardon? Okay. Yes, unfortunately, no. Um, yes, uh, the program successfully ran for about a year and a half to two years. They had major billboards, they got information coming in. <laughs> Uh, and then a new change in administration came along. The mayor of the city was very pro, and then when it changed over to another administration, fans dried out. Questions were asked about who was running it, and the identity of the civilian board was getting very close to being known by people it shouldn't be known by. The identity of that civilian board was only known by two people, three people. Um, in that area, and other than that, CSI, the person myself that did the um, communications with them. Um, so it has unfortunately closed at the moment. But we are working with two other cities um, in developing a Crime Stoppers program again in Mexico, using our American neighbors uh, to help in identifying. Um, individuals who can work as the civilian side and having a number that's moved outside Mexico to be answered. But one of the biggest problems with Crime Stoppers in Mexico when it was there, 
It's not getting the information. It's what to do with it. Because one of the biggest problems was their police force and how they could be trusted. And it was important that when the information came through Crime Stoppers, it went into a clearing area where anything to do with the person, name of town or wherever it came from was actually sterilized and sent back as information. It was quite a delicate task, but it did work. But unfortunately, when it came to the safety of the people, the civilians themselves, they took priority. And when the money drew up and dried down, you know, closed down, um, it was felt that we have to say, you know, let's wait until we get another administration that will work with us. Um, so that's the answer to, to your question there, Sam. Any other questions for the gentleman? Do you speak to him? Yes, sir. Captain, can you address um, the sentencing that you're getting? Are you getting the support of the justice system? Because I know in Canada, I can probably speak to the police officers, but they're all frustrated with sentencing uh, and deterrent. Um, and maybe more specifically for some of these seizures that you uh, showed up on your street. Well, <clears throat> I'll tell you that uh, the approach we take is, is like in many uh, jurisdictions in the U.S. is that if we meet the thresholds for federal prosecution, that's where we go. That's simply because the guidelines are, are very, very uh, stringent. The sentences are longer. And we try to, you know, put these bad boys and keep them in jail as long as we can. And so... Um, that's the thing, because sometimes, um, you know, let, speaking frankly, uh, candidly, uh, in, in areas, uh, there's political influences that take place in local prosecution. And it certainly is frustrating uh, because, you know, you, you know that these people are dangerous. Uh, you're trying to, to put them and keep them in jail. And uh, sometimes that doesn't work out. Uh, the only thing I tell my guys is, hey, our job is to investigate, to keep the community safe, and to put them in jail. And hopefully they'll stay there. Uh, but uh, we do work closely with all the agencies. Uh, and, you know, we have, like, it's known in, in the U.S., the task force style approach. And that is tremendous uh, because it gives us numerous resources, financial resources, plus, you know, we have a lot of different investigators, a lot of facilities, so uh, that approach uh, certainly helps, and we normally uh, function under the auspices of, of a, one of the U.S. attorneys that is assigned to the group, so we work, you know, hand in hand, our arresting with their prosecution. <laughs> But yes, we, we, we try to max them out as much as we can because, I mean, these guys, as you saw, uh, these type of seizures, um, we're talking about millions of dollars. And, and, and like I said, it's not just us. I mean, you find that in Nogales, Arizona. You find that in other points in New Mexico um, and all along the Texas border. You know, so, uh, and, and, and I just want you folks to know that it's a flood. I mean... Uh, we we contain it as much as we can, but you know I, I'm, I'm I wonder how many get through. You know I know what we capture, but I don't know how many get through. It's just a numbers game for those guys. So they expect their losses. You know it, it's kind of like you know the cost of doing business. They know that they're gonna that the police are gonna grab some loads, but uh, so let, instead of sending one or two, I'm gonna send out ten or twenty. And unfortunately, the the you know our our resources are limited. Our manpower is limited, and so that's why it's so important for us to have a, a strong community partnership because the community is going to be our eyes and ears. And uh, if if we if we work it together, we're gonna we're gonna get places. Yes, sir. Let me just, yeah. uh, to repeat the question, it was how do you protect the Crime Stoppers Board along the border for their safety? Well, uh, uh, the, the, the board, uh, 
doesn't really uh, expose themselves. You know, not many people know attend the, the board meetings. Uh, the board may be at, at social functions and stuff, but we've never really had any problem. You know, actually, um, you know, it, it's it's the, the danger is to to law enforcement. As you probably heard, there was an agent from Border Patrol unfortunately killed the other day, and that's just one of several incidents that have occurred recently. That that kind of shows me that these guys are, are becoming more aggressive towards U.S. law enforcement. But uh, board members never had a hair on anybody's head, head hurt yet. I think they're okay. A bigger issue in smaller communities where everybody knows each other. Everybody knows the uh, We had a case in the Bahamas where we were asked to put up a $2,000 reward for somebody for a burger uh, of a well known uh, businessman. And uh, rumor on the street was that uh, it was a fascination and that the guy that, that killed him. Uh, had received five thousand dollars. I sat there thinking, well, uh, the police assured me that they had information and that the the tip would come to pay or the reward would come to pay. But it occurred to me that if someone came forward to claim that reward, it was a criminal. Uh, you know, if someone prepared to bill someone five thousand, they give fifty thousand. If Frank Stoppers said, well, sorry, but you know. That information did not lead to an arrest or a conviction, therefore we are not paying that reward. So in small communities where everybody knows each other, our arms have a population of 350,000, and you know, prominent people are well known. We appear on TV, we're in the press, uh, everybody knows everybody as I say, and everybody knows who the criminals are. Um, so it is an issue. Uh, and uh, we certainly, as long as I'm involved with Frank Stoppers in the Department, uh, we would certainly not agree to, uh, to uh, post a report of that size. Again, we would just limit it to maximum $1,000. <coughs> I think we've had issues like that. I mean, we've never, fortunately, we've never experienced uh, any any retribution towards a, a board member or uh, not even just one of the employees of Crime Stoppers, um, but we have had issues with uh, family and friends of, of victims that want to exceed um, the awards, and and that certainly does create a problem. And I'm sure in a in a smaller community, it would be something that that, that can create considerable uh, issues, but uh, I think in general, I don't know unless someone else knows of the story where a board member has been attacked or hurt. One of the things that um, each board, uh, whether you are in a large city or a small community, should consider these days is a threat assessment. And you should look at sometimes getting your police force to give a threat assessment on what the situation is within your community. Um, in the Caribbean, most of our, with the exception of Trinidad and Jamaica, most of our countries, um, their calls are off island, within Florida or states or Canada. And the reason for that is to help us make sure that the person that answers the call may not know what the, or where the person is from. So that's why we promote that itself. But also when we look to um, uh, the Crime Stoppers program globally here itself. One of the things with um, Crime Stoppers is that we have a, a network of information. Um, you know, all of us sitting here represent a program that has a problem in their community in relation to, to, to firearms. So I'm wondering, is anyone here could come up with one of their ideas of what they do and how they can help and share it with these people? And throughout the day, maybe if you, you just mention this to someone else or if you'd like to come forward and say it. Anyone here from Miami-Dade County? No. They have an excellent program of buyback guns. And that's one of their uh, projects within the Crime Stoppers um, community. Uh, the board of directors promote this as a project within, within their community. 
So it's, it's sharing ideas that can get us to the next level of how we, as Crime Stoppers programs, can move forward within our own areas. Um, any further questions of the two speakers? Yes, sir. Can we go to the mic? Thank you. Hi. Uh, when uh, Vicente Fox was president of Mexico, he talked a great game about becoming a NAFTA partner and putting more efforts into getting rid of these cartels. I'd like to hear your perspective on whether you feel Mexico is taking the issue more seriously or less seriously at a federal level than they, than they did in the past. Well, on a personal note, what I've observed is that um, under, under the administration of Vicente Fox, um, everything went out of control. The previous party, which was the, the revolutionary party, or the, the previous party that was uh, in power for 71 years, pretty much had everything controlled in the aspect that, you know, the traffickers, the organizations did their thing and uh, they didn't really bother the average citizen. Under uh, President Fox's administration, the most notorious trafficker, Joaquin Chapo Guzman, uh, walked out of the prison and uh, since then, uh, as they say, all hell broke loose and uh, mass executions started occurring, uh, attacks, direct attacks, proactive uh, attacks on law enforcement and military started occurring, <clears throat> and uh, they started, the cartels started to diversify into the areas that I, I presented. You know, so um, I think um, the, the subsequent administration under Calderon uh, also um, was at a loss for what to do. Um, I, I am part of a, a program with the State Department where uh, we work on uh, training Mexican law enforcement and working with uh, the prosecutors <clears throat> because they are converting to oral judge, uh, judgments like, like we are. They're converting to the U.S. system. And so we're, we're trying to help them. Uh, unfortunately, um, corruption is a major issue and, and it's, it's very difficult. Um, in when you don't have a serious commitment, I've, um, what I have heard because I've been on an international um, conferences in Mexico where I've spoken, and uh, their big concern uh, is generally that uh, the U.S. is at fault for all the for all their problems, and uh, it certainly doesn't absolve them of their responsibility. But uh, it, it's it's going to be interesting to see what uh, Peña Nieto, the new president, does. I think it's certainly in, in their best interest to, to escalate the war against these people, but make it a serious war and work uh, closer with the U.S. As, as uh, my colleague here is talking about the programs, the international programs, uh, to be able to have the citizens of Mexico report directly to U.S.-based centers where we can, as we do in Laredo, work exclusively with uh, the Mexican Marines uh, in a, uh, a, with their vetted units. There's certain vetted units that they have that we work directly to uh, because we concentrate, as I mentioned, on those wholesale kidnappings. We concentrate on recovering U.S. citizens that are, that are in those houses. And uh, we, we've had good success. But again, uh, we, we need a, a, a very, very uh, strong commitment from the government of Mexico to make this easier. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate your attention. <coughs> we will now close the session and you can take a break next door. Please be back in here promptly at 1045 because we'll have a